Hi, welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. South Sudan's two main warring leaders have stopped fighting, but the peace deal itself is in trouble. Both President Salva Kiir and former Vice President and now Opposition Leader Riyak Machar agreed to a new peace deal last year. They were supposed to form a unity government to end the six-year civil war. In early November, the two leaders agreed to postpone, for the second time, forming the government due to ongoing disputes. Many wonder if the peace deal will hold it all. Today, I'm happy to have Emily Koidi with us. She's a civil society activist who participated in the peace talks that produced the current peace deal. Oh, thank you, Ellen. Emily, welcome to the podcast. Do you think these two leaders, President Salva Kiir and the opposition leader, Riyak Machar, are they ever going to form a unity government like they've promised to do? Chances are high that they are not going to form a unity government. Already they failed to form one on time. Uh, but also, if they ever form one, it's not going to be a properly functioning government. So you will have each one trying to checkmate the other, each one trying to outdo the other, but not necessarily working on the terms of the peace agreement. Unfortunately, that's what is going to happen. Uh, what exactly is keeping them from forming a unity government, or at least by their own accounts? What are the issues that's that's keeping this from moving forward currently? Well, at on top of the list is a lack of political will, especially from the incumbent government side, unfortunately. Uh, it's supposed to provide the requisite resources to implement the transitional security arrangements. Uh, by that, I mean money, of course, but also the institution that has been mandated uh, to to man the pre-transition period and set the necessary environment for formation of the unity government has not been able to deliver. The last time they had a meeting is around April or May. Until today, the NPTC, and that's the body that is supposed to mind the pre-transition, NPTC is the National Pre-Transitional Committee, has not had meetings since May, end of April. And that's, that's not right with the mammoth work that is required to be done. So the the essence seems to be in some ways the parties just aren't acting very seriously, which which speaks to your point about there just being a lack of political will at the top. But I also want to say that they much as that speaks more of what the incumbent government is the incumbent government's part, uh, I also think that uh, the opposition is complicit in a way because they are also members of the NPTC and they've not been able to express the challenges that are within the NPTC even when they are glaring challenges that we see with the leadership, with the way they run, they manage resources. Uh, The fact that the opposition uh, appears to be culpable in closing ranks among themselves as uh, parties uh, shows that they're really complicit in uh, in allowing the situation to be as it is. Now, you were at the peace talks in Khartoum, uh, where this peace deal came together between uh, President Salva Kiir and the opposition leader, Riyak Machar. These are the two, of course, who are supposed to form this unity government. Um, And previously, you've also been part of the uh, peace talks uh, in Addis Ababa. What was it like as a civil society uh, representative to the peace talks um, when it moved from Ethiopia to Sudan. How did you see the way the talks were conducted um, and how civil society itself was was handled? How did you see that change uh, with that move-in location? So we shifted from Addis to Khartoum, July 2018. Ethiopia had just gotten a new prime minister and uh, they were, it had its own pressures. Then uh, Sudan was allowed to take on the process. I think there was, uh, to be honest, there was much more consultation with civil society uh, in Addis compared to Khartoum. The environment, too, was more conducive for civil society in Addis than it was in Khartoum. It it took a lot of pressure for us to insist that we had to be in the process. So we had to do some, to knock some doors and say we have to be in this process. We've been in this process. And one of the principles that has always underpinned this process is inclusivity. And inclusivity means civil society uh, has to be involved and all parties have to be involved. 
uh, if we didn't push back, it was very likely that uh, the last time we would be seen in a peace process, in the peace talks, was going to be Addis. How did the Sudanese government handle the talks differently than they were handled in Ethiopia with the parties themselves? Did the did the manner of mediation change? Uh, one thing that we heard quite a bit, uh, there was a lot of complaints from especially opposition figures uh, at that time that the Sudanese government was putting a lot of uh, coercive pressure on them to to sign a final peace deal, a uh, pressure that wasn't uh, quite there in the same way in Ethiopia. Um, I think the, the environment uh, for sure wasn't, it, it was an environment of pressure. The, the venue itself was a, a, a national security base, a training facility. And uh, it, 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 there was, it would give this feeling of you are sort of imprisoned in a way. It was also a place that was expressing uh, power of the mediator. That is the government of Sudan at the time. That's the feeling it gave. Most of the times what we had was uh, parties being consulted separately and uh, without necessarily knowing the position of the other parties. And then before we know it, the mediation has come up with a position. We interacted with members of opposition who expressed being coerced by the government of Sudan. Uh, some of them also being paid off. Uh, the, the, the members of the opposition who had a price tag, I would say, that was easily affordable and they were willing to give in, were given certain things. So the Sudanese took over these peace talks and they took a method of a much more forceful and coercive mediation process, whereas previously in Ethiopia it was more consultative. Mm -hmm. um, um, but also that process had produced one peace agreement that had fallen apart pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and the renewed peace talks weren't really heading anywhere. So then Ethiopia handed off the peace talks to to President Bashir, and the Sudanese come in, and, and instead of letting the parties negotiate with each other, they basically start putting proposals on the table and then pressuring the parties to sign it. And that's led us to this current peace deal, uh, which has had very, um, has produced a ceasefire, but hasn't really succeeded in, in pushing the parties together. Do you think one of the things that uh, that's really helped lead to where we're at now and it's and the fact that peace deal is stalled, do you think uh, President Bashir's fall from power and really Sudan's role as the party that can help pressure everyone uh, to implement the peace deal that really the Sudanese themselves brokered, do you think that's one of the reasons we've ended up where we're at? Uh, I don't think that's really it. Uh, I think we got an agreement that was signed, but with parties who are more divided uh, to the extent that they will not be able to implement what they have signed to. Ultimately, this peace deal will probably move ahead or fall apart on whether or not President Kiir and Riyak Machar are able to work together. Um, one thing that I've heard quite a bit, and I think others have, is that in Sudan we've seen, you know, with the fall of Bashir and a new transition and a new political transition there, uh, the military generals who took over power and also the civilian leadership who came in, they agreed that they would step down after this transitional period and the elections. Um, and many people are wondering why it is that in South Sudan, they keep signing peace deals in which the two warring parties, they both want to be in power during the transitional period heading up to elections, and they want to stay in power after the elections, which in some ways doesn't really seem to, to move the country forward out of the current power struggle. Part of the issue is that these two leaders, you know, probably need to step aside at some point. So so why is it that we've seen in Sudan, they get a political transition, which does have an exit for the current uh, political leaders. And then in South Sudan, we're sort of stuck in this place where it looks like we're with President Kiir and Riyak Machar competing against each other really indefinitely, even if this peace process moves forward. I think there are two main reasons. One, uh, the, in, in comparison to the Sudan process, South Sudan's uh, process has not had adequate public pressure that sends a signal to these two individuals that they can't lead anymore or that they they cannot they cannot govern anymore or do so together or uh, or singularly mm -hmm. so uh, that that pressure has not been adequate uh, the people have not pushed back civil society has tried to push 
on behalf of the ordinary citizens but the ordinary citizens have not been able to to express their their displeasure and that they are tired and they have finally figured that these are not the people who can govern this country number 2 is that until now uh, there has not yet come out an altern- alternative figures in south sudan who we can be certain that can replace these individuals so the fear is often if these are not there then who is going to lead uh, they might they might not be the best of course they might not be capable or they actually not capable but then if they go then who you see in sudan's case immediately they were able to figure out who were the people who can run the transition they were able they had a process in place that could quickly figure that out we are not yet at that level and it makes it difficult to get a process that is the equivalent of sudan or if you like the liberian peace process from what you've seen from being inside the peace talks do you think igad and igad's the the regional block of countries that's been tasked with mediating this peace deal really since the war broke out in 2013 Do you think EGAD is up to the task and if not what has been the challenge to to getting a uh, a higher level mediation? I think I think EGAD uh is has had challenges and uh they there's got to be a point where it's going to have to admit that it can't uh man this process alone or might want to to let it go to another entity what igad has not been able to do is that there has been uh, repeated violations from the different actors of the peace agreement and there is no single occasion that we have seen igad decisively punish or prescribe punitive measures to the different actors so the message has always been that with igad it's business as usual we can always do what we want But then the 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 reason why it becomes difficult to take the process away from EGAD is because of this whole principle of subsidiarity where the AU will still say it has to be the region that has to man the process and so will the UN and all the others. If we must move from EGAD alone we might have to get a solid tripartite sort of arrangement of mediation or we we there has to be some creative thinking around what next if it's not igad and definitely when this peace process god forbid fails we are headed to a place where people are going to say enough of igad we want something else yeah and that's the real challenge uh you know uh we've also highlighted as as crisis group which is igad as the the group of regional nations they've uh, struggled to stay united enough and engaged enough um to actually mediate this process but then like you said because the African Union has these rules that they can't take over the peace process unless they're asked to do so by their the uh subsidiary regional body um then the peace process basically gotten stuck in this in this current place uh that we're at which has led to a lot of frustrations among South Sudanese um and also among many of the other diplomats tasked with this um I just want to talk briefly about where we're at currently in the in the in the peace process and what's blocking the formation of the government um i've done a lot of travel recently in south sudan on the ground and also was in addis for the uh for the recent latest round of of talks between the the parties and the issue that really comes up a lot is the issue of states the number of states the boundaries of states this is one of the two main issues that's left unresolved that's keeping this government from being uh formed can you help everyone understand what the issue of states is about and why it's become such a highly charged political issue so we we initially had the agreement the peace agreement that preceded the current one and uh, that peace agreement was signed on the basis of 10 states 10 states are what we got independence with then in t- in october 20 uh 15 after the peace agreement the first peace agreement was signed uh, post independence so then we had uh, we had the government from 28 states but unfortunately there was no there was not no pushback on the illegality of this in the context of the peace agreement it was we did not make it 
make a deliberate effort to tell the government at the time that, look, what you have done is not right. But we lost the opportunity to change, to push back and say this is not right because this agreement you signed supersedes the transitional constitution under its jurisdiction, you cannot form 28 states. So South Sudan, at independence, has 10 states. They sign a peace deal uh, in the first bit of the war uh, in 2015. And after that peace deal signed, the government on its own declares 28 new states. The opposition rejects this. How did we get to 32 states, which is the current number? Well, we get to 32 states because there was not much pushback on 28 states. So there were more people who are demanding for states and the president wants to be popular and his party wants to be popular. So they had to 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 give states to some individuals who were a th- who appeared to be a threat to the to the status quo and were saying we you give us this and we will be loyal to you. So we have so then we have 10 uh, 20, 32 states today. Uh, there are chances that we could even have more if there is not much pressure. And so why is it Why is it you think the opposition um, is unwilling to come back to, to form a government under the current 32 states? I'm just asking because many, many people, you know, especially at higher levels, they look at this and they, and they think that it's remarkable given how many people have died in the civil war and how much effort has been put in trying to move this peace deal forward that an issue like the number of states is becoming the sort of, you know, one of the chief obstacle, if not the chief obstacle at the moment uh, towards them forming a unity government. Um, so it, it, in the formation of these 28 and eventually 32 states, uh, different communities were eventually annexed to, uh, to places that they were initially not annexed to. Uh, historically, they are not. They are not. They do not consider themselves to be part of those states that have been created. The other thing is also how they are going to allocate the the council of states and their governors. It's going to be quite complicated. What the the calculations on the side of opposition when it comes to thirty two states are not favorable for those for whatever they want to get. You mentioned at the beginning that you didn't think these two would eventually form a unity government. Mm -hmm. Now, in many ways, that means this peace deal might be uh, bound to fail um, because, of course, the the peace deal says that these two are supposed to form a unity government and then move to elections. Um, What do you think can be done to prevent this war from breaking out again? Uh, So, of course, for war to break out, there has to be people must have arms at their disposal easy access to arms. To me, one of the priorities has to be that we ensure that none of the actors in the current process we have has access to arms that they are going to use against not just themselves, but eventually against civilians. Number two is uh, there has to be constant engagement with them, uh, but also to nudge for opening up of the political space so that political discourse, meaningful political discourse discourse and debate looks more attractive than choosing violent means to to get into power. Uh, The more we allow for the space for people to be able to speak their minds, then they they find the other options less attractive. The civic and political space has to be opened uh, alongside constant engagement and dialogue with all these people but also encouraging alternative leadership. You've had a unique opportunity to sit in on a, as a South Sudanese citizen in the peace talks over many years, and then also to serve on the, the oversight body, which was tasked with managing um, and overseeing how the parties were implementing the, the peace deal. What do you think you've learned most about the current crop of leaders from being inside that process? I honestly think they are not the true representation of the potentials of South Sudan. They are a misrepresentation of what the people of South Sudan aspire for, what we can be, and what we have always wanted. We, we, did, not, we did not spend 21 years thinking that we would come to fight amongst ourselves, that they f- decided to fight amongst themselves as leaders. That does not represent us. Number two is... 
we wanted development. If they are not able to work for development, they do not represent the aspirations of South Sudanese. We, we wanted to have our resources well managed. Today, our resources are being looted. They end up in individual pockets. That's not what we wanted. That does not represent the South Sudanese aspiration. So to me, that, that, that sums it up. Emily, thanks for coming on our podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. The Horn is a production of the International Crisis Group. To read our reports or sign up for our newsletter, go to crisisgroup.org. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. This episode was produced by Maeve Francis.